On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because nobody in our government at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes in the buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC-7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of the incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. We went after Iraq. They did not knock down the World Trade Center, okay? It wasn't the Iraqis that knocked down the World Trade Center. We went after Iraq. We decimated the country. Iran's taken over. Okay. 
But it wasn't the Iraqis. You will find out who really knocked down the World Trade Center, because they have papers in there that are very secret. You may find it's the Saudis, okay? But you will find out. But it wasn't Iraq. And Donald Trump says, uh, quote, elect me and you'll find out who really knocked down the Twin Towers. He's saying, elect me and I will expose 9-11. They may go ahead and kill him. I mean, you need to pray for Donald Trump right now, folks. And by the way, we need your prayers. first thing you have to know about 9-11 is that the official narrative is a conspiracy theory. Vice President Dick Cheney admitted in 2006 that there was no evidence linking Osama bin Laden to 9-11. Nobody has evidence to support the official narrative that Osama bin Laden orchestrated 9-11. But uh, so we've never made the case or argued the case that somehow Osama bin Laden was directly involved in 9-11. That evidence uh, has never been forthcoming. In October of 2001, this video was released and shown to the people of America and the world, and we were all told that this was Osama bin Laden accepting responsibility for the attacks on September 11th. But let's compare the Osama in this video to a photograph of the known Osama. When you compare the two, you'll notice that the Osama in the video has a shorter nose. He also appears to be a little chubbier. As the Osama in the video waves his hand, look carefully. You'll see he's wearing a ring and a wristwatch. Jewelry is forbidden by people of the Islamic faith. You'll also notice that when he signs on this pad, he's signing with his right hand. We know that the real Osama was left-handed. So we have to ask this question, where did this video come from? And why was it fabricated to mislead the people of America and the world? If you visit the FBI.gov website, you'll find the 10 most wanted list. And on that list, of course, is Osama bin Laden. You can pull up his wanted poster. And on that poster is a list of charges that he's wanted for. The curious thing is that nowhere in the list of charges is any mention of September 11th. The Muckraker Report contacted Rex Toom, a spokesperson for the FBI, and asked why was there no mention of the attacks on September 11th on Osama's wanted poster. Mr. Toombs' response was, we have no hard evidence linking Osama bin Laden with the attacks on September 11th. Now we have some breaking news coming into the MSNBC newsroom. A federal judge has approved a request by prosecutors to officially dismiss all criminal charges against Osama bin Laden. To officially dismiss all criminal charges against Osama bin Laden. There was constant discussion about him hiding out in caves, and I think many times the American people have a perception that it's a little hole dug out of a side of a mountain. Oh, no. This is it. This is a fortress. Yes. A complex, multi-tiered, bedrooms and offices on the top, as you can see. Secret <laughs> exits on the side and, the end, and on the bottom. Cut deep to avoid thermal detection. A ventilation system to allow people to breathe and to carry on. The entrance is large enough to drive trucks and even tanks even computer systems and telephone systems. It's a very sophisticated operation. Oh, you bet. This is serious business. And, and there's not one of those. There are many of those. Okay, what, what can we say to such a person? Okay, all we can do is appeal to scientific values. And if he doesn't share those values, the conversation is over. Okay, if someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence are you going to provide to prove that they should value it? If someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument could you provide to show the importance of logic? Now that we know Osama bin Laden was not responsible for 9-11, who claimed that he was? Former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak was on BBC one hour after the North Tower collapsed, blaming Osama. 
the uh, uh, bin Laden sits in Afghanistan. There is a source well, who of else terror. Who you identify, though? Uh, because we're not saying he's responsible for this. Necessarily. Bin Laden, who is behind this very attack, when you and the whole world will realize. Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, warned the United States before 9-11 that a major terrorist attack would take place. This report was confirmed by Mossad officer Jabal Aviv. There was a report, you'll recall, that the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, did indeed send representatives to the U.S. to warn just before 9-11 that a major terrorist sure, attack sure. was imminent. And that's why Israel had information that they were giving the American government specific information. There will be an attack in North America uh, within the th next 30 days. There will be uh, a hijacking of aircraft, and those aircraft will be used as flying bombs. That was available at the time. In 1995, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wrote a book called Fighting Terrorism. In this book, he writes that militant Islam will bring down the World Trade Center. So I wrote a book in 1995 and I said that if, it, if the West doesn't wake up to the suicidal nature of militant Islam, the next thing you'll see uh, is uh, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. Uh, BuzzFeed dug up an old quote from Donald Trump talking about a large-scale terror attack 19 months before 9-11. In his 2000 book, The America We Deserve, Trump wrote, I really am convinced we're in danger of the sort of terrorist attacks that will make the bombing of the 1993 Trade Center look like little kids playing with firecrackers. Trump also mentioned the mastermind of the attack, writing, quote, one day we're told that a shadowy figure with no fixed address named Osama bin Laden is public enemy number one and U.S. jet fighters lay waste to his camp in Afghanistan. He escapes back under some rock and a few news cycles later it's on to a new enemy and a new crisis. Uh, the alliance between Israel and America has always been extremely strong. It's about to get even stronger. Uh, President Trump and I see eye to eye on the dangers emanating from the region, but also on the opportunities. Both Netanyahu and Trump wrote books about 9-11 well before it happened, and that Osama bin Laden was responsible. Interesting. It began when this woman was watching the Twin Towers burning from her apartment in New Jersey. She noticed three men on top of a van, posing for pictures with the towers burning in the background. And I could see that they were like happy, you know, they, 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 were, they didn't look shocked to me, you know, they didn't look shocked. I thought it was very strange. The witness called police, who stopped the van hours later and arrested five men. All five, it turns out, were Israeli. They were turned over to the FBI. Sources tell ABC News during a check of national security databases, some of the men were listed as having had connections with Israeli intelligence. At the FBI, that set off alarm bells. A major terrorist manhunt began, and just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by Patrolman Scott DiCarlo. We would ask to detain the van and the passengers. They were just removed from the vehicle, patted down for safety precaution, and, uh, you know, detained. 911 call at 410 Park. I think once the uh, FBI arrived, one of them stated that they were on our side. There's something to that effect. Five Israelis were arrested for filming and celebrating as the first tower was hit. As they were being arrested, one of them told Officer DiCarlo, we are Israeli. We are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem. Please search the vehicle and explosive residue was found. The five Israelis arrested, Savan Kurtzberg, Paul Kurtzberg, Yaron Shmuel, Oded Elner, and Omar Mamari were part of a Mossad front company called Urban Moving Systems. Juval Aviv is a counter-terrorism advisor to the U.S. Congress, but was once a spy for Israel's secret service Mossad. He says Urban Moving was a front company for Israeli intelligence, and that some of its workers were spying illegally in the U.S. Israel has engaged in intelligence gathering in friendly countries, 
some of it is done with permission and some of it probably has been done without permission in areas that is vital to Israeli interest. Secretary of State Colin Powell also confirmed their arrests. I'm aware that uh, some Israeli citizens have been detained. With respect to why they are being retain detained and the other aspects of, of your question, whether it's because they are in intelligence services or what they were doing, I will uh, defer to the Department of Justice and the FBI to answer that. The FBI wasn't satisfied. Channel 4 has learned from intelligence sources that some of the men's names were already known to American counterintelligence. Paul Kurtzberg admitted serving in an Israeli army anti-terrorist unit. He refused to take a lie detector test for 10 weeks. I was uh, serving in a special unit in the army, and it's not a big secret or something like that. But uh, there are things that I have to keep to, uh, to myself as uh, loyal to my country. Some of the Israelis were discovered to be Mossad agents after their names were run through the database. This was confirmed by Vince Canistaro, former chief of operations for counterterrorism, CIA. The FBI needed the answers to three important questions. Who were these men? What brought them to that parking lot on the morning of September 11th? And did they have any advanced knowledge of what was going to happen that day? And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. They went on an Israeli talk show to explain their actions. Their excuse was that they were coming from a country which experiences terrorism daily. So their purpose was to document the event. How did they know there was going to be a terrorist event? And that's why Israel had information that they were giving the American government specific information. There will be an attack in North America uh, within the th next 30 days. There will be uh, a hijacking of aircraft and those aircraft will be used as flying bombs. That was available at the time. What about this question of advanced knowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11? How clear are investigators that some Israeli agents may have known something? Well, it's very explosive information, obviously, and there's a great deal of evidence that they say they have collected, none of it necessarily conclusive. It's more when they put it all together. A bigger question, they say, is how could they not have known? Almost a direct quote, Brent. They knew because they were Mossad agents. Mossad officially warned the United States that there was going to be a major terrorist attack. Their van was at the scene as early as 8 a.m. After examining the confiscated footage, Police confirmed that the Israelis were, in fact, celebrating as the first tower was hit. I've got so many questions, but you are vindicated. This has got to be the 50th time the last six months on the radical Muslims celebrating, not just in New Jersey, but New York, Palestine, all over. What do you have to say? They're still attacking you, though we've got Dan Rather on video. We've got New York Post. We've got Washington Post. We've got, uh, I mean, what's going on here? Well, I took a lot of heat, and I was very strong on it, and I held uh, my line, and then all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of people were calling up my office. I was the other day in Sarasota, Florida, and people are in line, and we had 12,000 people, which is fantastic. And the people were saying, many of the people from New Jersey, four or five people said, Mr. Trump, I saw it myself. I was there. They talked about Patterson, but they said, I saw it myself, Mr. Trump. I was there. So many people have called in, and, and on Twitter, at real Donald Trump, they're all tweeting. So I knew it happened, and I held my line, and people wanted me to apologize, and uh, we can't do that. People like you and I can't do that so easily. Now, we can do it if we're wrong, Alex. You apologize. I'd apologize if I was wrong. But they were celebrating, and they were celebrating the fall of the World Trade Center. I think that's disgraceful. I watched when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. So something's going on. We got to find out what it is. I uh, know Donald Trump. Uh, I know him very well. Uh, and I, I think his attitude, his support 
for Israel and is clear he, he feels very warmly about the Jewish state. Israelis, Jews to be precise, were arrested celebrating 9-11. Trump is going around telling the world that Muslims were celebrating 9-11. Is he covering for Israel? Keep in mind that Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu both wrote books about 9-11 well before it happened. We had uh, one report early on from another intelligence service that suggested uh, that uh, the lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta, had met with Iraqi intelligence officials in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Um, and that reporting waxed and waned with a degree of confidence in it and so forth. It has been pretty well knocked down now at this stage. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. For more than an hour, Secretary Powell displays photos, holds up a chemical vial that suggests anthrax. I'm sitting there. Well, how stuck did with you this. feel? I felt you, terrible. And six months later, the intelligence community is still standing behind their original judgments, even though nothing has been found. I understood the consequences of that, of that failure, and as I've said on many occasions, I deeply regret that the information, some of the information, not all of it, some of the information I presented, which was multi-source, was wrong. And it is a blot on my record. But, you know, I, there's nothing I can do to change that blot. Israeli intelligence tried to link Iraq to 9-11 by creating a lie that one of the hijackers, Al-Qaeda member Mohammed Atta, met with Iraqi officials in Prague where they gave him anthrax. Even though this was proven to be a lie, Netanyahu told Congress that Iraq should be invaded anyway. Um, I think... Well, excuse me one second. Uh, you're making a connection between the Taliban and Iraq? Yes, I am. I'm saying that the, uh, if you look at those who harbor terrorists uh, and those who uh, support terrorists... Uh, and no, support I guess I was looking for a connection between September 11th and my understanding why we went to the Taliban is there was a connection there. They were harboring somebody that we believed did the act on September 11th. Yes, that's the first reason why you did it. Now you're going to take me from September 11th to Iraq somehow? Yes, but I'm saying something else. I'm saying the connection is not whether Iraq was directly connected to September 11th, but how do you prevent the next September 11th? Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Netanyahu was still trying to link them together. Two days after 9-11, Netanyahu went on television and use the attack to justify invading Iraq. What is important to understand uh, is that you have to dismantle the entire terror empire, and especially before its main practitioners, the terror states of Iran and Iraq, acquire nuclear weapons. And this, I, I think, has been a wake-up call from hell. It is telling us, you have the power now to act. Summon the will. Let's take a look at the anthrax letters which killed five people. We know Israel lied about Osama bin Laden orchestrating 9-11. We know Israeli intelligence lied about Mohammed Atta getting anthrax from Iraqi officials in Prague. Now look what it says on the bottom. Death to Israel, Allah is great. Gee, I wonder who wrote this. The FBI concluded that the anthrax was created and sent by Dr. Bruce Ivins of the U.S. Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. He was not a Muslim. He was a Christian Zionist who loved Israel. He wrote in 2006, By blood and faith, Jews are God's chosen and have no need for dialogue with any Gentile. He supported Bush's mass murder of Muslims in Afghanistan and Iraq. He committed suicide once the FBI was on to him. Initially, it was believed that Al-Qaeda sent these letters. Well, four Israelis were arrested living next door to Mohammed Atta in Florida. They were all Mossad agents. This was confirmed by the Justice Department. I can't include the footage because if you try to re-upload it, YouTube will block it worldwide. The full report with the FBI searching their apartments is still available online. Just look for this. So, Israel officially warned the United States that there's going to be a major terrorist attack soon. Mossad agents were living next door to Mohammed Atta and their excuse was that they were spying on Arabs. Instead of stopping the terrorist attack, they let it happen and got caught celebrating. Mohammed Atta was used to justify not just the invasion of Iraq,
but Afghanistan as well by way of the fake Osama confession. Ada didn't have ties to Afghanistan or Iraq. He was tied to Israel. They're living, they've got, they've got these 7th century or 14th century goggles that they're uh, looking at the world through. And, you know, if we, if we pipe Baywatch over on the satellite dish, that's a, you know, an offense that they're w willing to die for. Sam Harris and other Israeli propagandists will often claim that 9-11 happened because Muslims hate our freedom and they blew themselves up because we allow women to wear whatever they want. Well, according to the FBI, some of the hijackers weren't even Muslim. Mohammed Atta was hanging out at strip clubs, banging strippers and snorting cocaine. These guys had money flowing out their ass. I mean, excuse my language, but they never seemed to run out of money. I mean, they was just, just tossing money left and right. I mean, it was just like, oh my God. And they had, they had mass supplies of cocaine. The entire video is silent, and yet the image is unnerving. The 9-11 mastermind and his accomplice laughing it up and then going through their lines for a performance of martyrdom wills. Jarrah frequently stumbles through his own martyrdom tape. Can't maintain a serious tone. His Al-Qaeda handlers coach him to be more dramatic. Start again, one of them scolds him off camera. This speech requires passion. Why don't you try a different approach? A second man chimes in. This is not reality jihadism. This is more, in fact, scripted, edited, stylized. Hijacker Ziad Jarrah's cousin, Ali Jarrah, was arrested in Lebanon for spying for Israel. He confessed that he was spying for 25 years. Not one, but two hijackers were tied to Israel. Mohammed Atta lived next door to Mossad agents, and Ziad Jarrah's cousin was a Mossad agent. Better yet, Ziad Jarrah's passport miraculously survived the explosion. Listen to a terrorist threatening his own country. The streets of America shall run red with blood. He was a suburban California kid, a lover of heavy metal, who became one of the most wanted men on the planet. The grandson of a Jewish doctor, Adam Perlman, morphed into Adam Gadon, the American mouthpiece of Al-Qaeda. September 11th demonstrated that America is not invincible. Adam Gadon, real name Adam Perlman, is an Al-Qaeda terrorist who is Jewish. He comes from a family of well-connected Zionists. His grandfather, Carl Perlman, was the first local chairman of the Bonds for Israel campaign, chairman of the United Jewish Welfare Fund, and was also a board member of the ADL. In the past, Adam was arrested for beating up Muslims. He also wrote essays condemning Muslims as bloodthirsty terrorists. Then he began working with the Mossad, putting out Israeli propaganda about 9-11. And the other variables that Bob wants to invoke here, and again, specifically on Islam, economics and political oppression, don't account for this behavior. The 19 hijackers were living in Germany. They all were college educated. Most of them had PhDs. These are engineers and architects. All the brothers who took part in the raids on America were dedicated, strong-willed, highly motivated in individuals with a burning concern for Islam and Muslims. And they had to be to be chosen for such a difficult mission. They were definitely not failures looking for a way out. Look at the pilots, Muhammad Atta, Marwan Shehi, Ziad Jarrah, Hani Hanjour. All of them had, had lived and studied in the West. All of them had the world within their reach if they had wanted it. But how could they live with themselves if they were to enjoy this worldly life while their ummah burns. Israel lied about Iraq harboring terrorists and did the same thing with Palestine. In 2002, Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon said that Al-Qaeda was operating in Gaza. Three days later, Mossad agents were arrested by the Palestinian Authority while trying to set up an Al-Qaeda front. 
Al-Qaeda has always been a tool Israel used to justify bombing another country. Israeli soldiers got caught working with Al-Qaeda at the Israeli-Syrian border, and photographs were taken. This alliance was confirmed by Ephraim Halavi, who was the director of Mossad during 9-11. He ran the operations. He also publicly admitted that Al-Qaeda was being treated at hospitals in Israel, which is harboring terrorists. There have been reports that Israel has been treating wounded Syrian rebel fighters in its yeah, hospitals yeah, on the border, yeah. including fighters from Nusra Front, yeah. uh, which is, of course, the Al-Qaeda proxy in Syria. Um, do those reports worry you that Israel's helping wounded Al-Qaeda-aligned fighters? As I said before, in a different context, it's always useful also to deal with your enemies in a humane way. So it's purely humanitarian, you say? So there's no tactical or political strategic... I didn't say there's no tactical. I said the main consideration, Fine. the immediate consideration Fine. is humane. But the tactical issues involved, I mean, you know better than me the phrase blowback. You don't think there's going to be blowback against Israel if you get into bed with a, a group like Nusra Front? No, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be blowback. Why? Because I think that, the, unfortunately, the rules of the game in Syria are such that you can do anything that is not able, is not possible to be done anywhere else. Yeah, I think people said that in Afghanistan too. Would you also treat Hezbollah fighters? No, I would not treat... Have you not just contradicted what you told me no, 60 I seconds ago? No, But humanely no, treating no, your enemies? No, no. I think as far as Hezbollah uh, uh, fighters are concerned, with them we have a different uh, account. So let me be clear, you would, you, you're happy to treat Al-Qaeda fighters, we have, but not Hezbollah we fighters? Have, we have a different account with Hezbollah, a totally different account, because Hezbollah has carried out the type of uh, actions against us which pre preclude us from going into what the Al-Qaeda has done. Al-Qaeda, to the best of my recollection, has up to now not attacked Israel. But has attacked your number one ally and protector and sponsor in the United States of America. There is a quote-unquote war on terror being going on for 15 years. In 16 years, Al-Qaeda, including its rebranding called ISIS, has never attacked Israel despite being next door. ISIS attacked Israel once, but that was by accident. Former Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Lan publicly said that ISIS accidentally attacked Israel, then apologized. Trump and Israel's propaganda minister Alex Jones brags about an interview Trump did on the day of 9-11 where he said bombs were used. Let's take a look. Donald, you're probably the best known builder, uh, particularly of, of, of great buildings in the city. There's a great deal of question about whether or not the damage and, and the ultimate destruction of the buildings was caused by the airplanes, by architectural defect, or possibly by bombs or or aftershocks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it was an architectural defect. You know, the World Trade Center was always known as a very, very strong building. Don't forget, that took a big bomb in the basement. Now, the basement is the most vulnerable place because that's your foundation. And it withstood that. And I got to see that area about three or four days after it took place because one of my structural engineers actually took me for a tour because he did the building. And I said, I can't believe it. The building was standing solid and half of the columns were blown out. I mean, so. This was an unbelievably powerful building. Uh, if you know anything about structure, it was one of the first buildings that was built from the outside. The steel, the reason the World Trade Center had such narrow windows is that in between all the windows, you had the steel on the outside. So you had the steel on the outside of the building. That's why when I first looked, and you had big, heavy I-beams. When I first looked at it, I couldn't believe it because there was a hole in the steel. And this is steel that was, you remember the, the width of the windows in the World Trade Center, folks. I think, you, you know, if you were ever up there, they were quite narrow. And in between was this heavy steel. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or 747 or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through the steel? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously. Because I just can't imagine anything being able to go through that wall. Most buildings are built with the steelers on the inside around the elevator shaft. This one was built from the outside, which is the strongest structure you can have, and it was almost just like a, uh, like a can of soup. You know, Donald, we were looking at pictures all morning long of that plane coming into uh, building number two, and when you see that uh, approach the, the far side, and then all of a sudden, within a matter of a millisecond, the explosion pops out the other side. Right. I just think that it was a plane with more than just fuel. I think, obviously, they were very big planes. They were going very rapidly because 
I was also watching where the plane seemed to be not only going fast, it seemed to be coming down into the building. So it was getting the speed from going downhill, so to speak. Uh, it just seemed to me that to do that kind of destruction is even more than a big plane, because you're talking about taking out steel, the heaviest caliber steel that was used on a building. I mean, these buildings were rock solid. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing. And it's not right to call up and then extrapolate and connect him to 9-11 when he came out on the day of 9-11 and the day after on Fox and on CNN and said, I believe there had to be bombs in those buildings. It was brought down by explosives. A plane doesn't do that. And then describe the architecture of Tower 1 and Tower 2. If he was an insider, he wouldn't have said that. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, how is it possible that um, a Boeing plane would be able to destroy the, or two planes would be able to destroy the Twin Towers? Because they were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat. And people were willing to die, and uh, when they're willing to die, and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. I mean, the, the heat and the power, actually it was amazing that the, the initial jolts didn't jar the building as much as people would have thought. But the, the tremendous amounts of fuel that was dumped on the building and 1,600 degrees temperature, I guess that's probably more than anything could take, no matter what. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or a 747 or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through this deal? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously. They were constructed to withstand like a 707 attack. Well, it's tremendous power and tremendous heat. And people were willing to die. And uh, when they're willing to die and when they're willing to become kamikazes of a sense, uh, there's very little you can do about it. So, Trump and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu wrote about 9-11 well before it happened. Israelis were arrested celebrating 9-11, and Trump covered it up telling the world that Muslims were celebrating 9-11. And Trump said on 9-11 that explosives had to have been used, but two days later he flip-flopped and said that the planes brought down the buildings. To this day, Trump is still lying and pushing the Israeli narrative that Muslims somehow brought down the World Trade Center. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. I'm a newcomer to politics, but not to backing the Jewish state. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us. Attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated, by the Islamic fundamentalists. Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100%. You look at Larry Silverstein, who's a terrific owner in New York and a very good friend of mine who I just called. I was very worried about him because I assume maybe he was in the building. He took possession of the building one week ago. As you know, he just bought the World Trade Center. Right. Seven weeks before 9-11, two Israeli billionaires purchased the lease to the World Trade Center. Larry Silverstein and Frank Lowy, who was an Israeli commando. Lowy was also a part of a Jewish terrorist group called the Haganah. The Haganah not only committed terrorism against British forces in Palestine, but also bombed Jewish sites in Iraq and elsewhere in the Middle East, making it look like Arabs did it, to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. Naim Galadi and many other Israelis write about this. I bring this up because when Frank Lowy was young, he was framing Arabs for political benefit, to increase Jewish immigration to Palestine. Decades later, he purchases the lease for the World Trade Center and frames Arabs for political benefit. After 9-11, what happened? The United States began bombing Israel's enemies in the Middle East. Larry Silverstein, who also purchased the lease to the World Trade Center, admitted in Israel that he began designing a new World Trade Center in 2000, while the buildings were still standing. 
And so, next thing you know, we've got the designs of a building. And the first design meeting was in April of 2000. And construction began shortly thereafter in 2002. But we ran into a problem. We couldn't collect the insurance because the insurance companies didn't want to pay. There were 22 insurance companies defending 22 insurers who didn't want to pay their obligations under the policies. And so they took me to court and I had to beat them in court, the lower court, and then had to take an appeal and win in the upper court. So they owed me four and a half billion. A new governor was just elected, Elliot Spitzer, an old friend who I knew well. I said, Elliot, if you don't help me, I'll never collect from the insurance companies. And guess what? He listened and he said, you know what? You're entitled. I'm going to get you the money. And in six months, he got me the four and a half billion dollars. The insurance companies didn't like me, but at least I got the money. I remember getting a call from the uh, fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing to do is, is pull it. Uh, and they made that decision to pull. And then we watched the building collapse. I see what's happening down there is a mess, and the developer is actually a friend of mine, but he didn't want to build this building either. If you look back at the records, I mean, when it was first foistered upon him, Larry Silverstein is a great guy, he's a good guy, he's a friend of mine. Trump's good friend, Israeli billionaire Larry Silverstein, admitted that he began designing a new World Trade Center in 2000. Also, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu wrote in 1995 that militant Islam would bring down the World Trade Center. Interesting. Silverstein and Netanyahu are actually good friends as well. Silverstein admitted that Netanyahu would call him every Sunday. We heard Silverstein bragging about making four and a half billion dollars from insurance, so 9-11 was good for him. Was 9-11 good for Netanyahu? Benjamin Netanyahu has publicly said the September 11th attacks have been good for Israel. Netanyahu said, quote, we're benefiting from one thing and that is the attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the American struggle in Iraq. Netanyahu said that 9-11 was good for Israel because it swung American public opinion towards supporting a war against Iraq. If you doubt Ma'ariv and Haaretz claims, you can read Netanyahu's book, Fighting Terrorism, and you'll see that he sources both those news outlets several times. Netanyahu also told the New York Times that 9-11 was very good for Israel. Asked tonight what the attack meant for relations between the United States and Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, the former prime minister, replied, it's very good. Then he edited himself, well not very good, but it will generate immediate sympathy. He predicted that the attack would strengthen the bond between our two peoples, because we've experienced terror over so many decades, but the United States has now experienced a massive hemorrhaging of terror. Netanyahu has publicly stated twice that 9-11 was good for Israel. How does Trump feel about Netanyahu? My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. And frankly, a strong prime minister is a strong Israel. And you truly have a great prime minister. In Benjamin Netanyahu, there's nobody like him. He's a winner. He's highly respected. He's highly thought of by all. And people really do have great, great respect for what's happened in Israel. So vote for Benjamin. Terrific guy. Terrific leader. Great for Israel. President-elect Trump, my friend, congratulations on being elected President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. Trump and Netanyahu, who have been friends for years, are both being financed by Israeli billionaire 
Sheldon Adelson. Adelson gave over $100 million to Trump's campaign and hailed Trump as the best president for Israel ever. First of all, there's nobody on this stage that's more pro-Israel than I am, okay? There's nobody. I am pro-Israel. For those who aren't aware, two towers were hit by planes, but three towers fell. Fact is, World Trade Center 7 was never hit by a plane. The official narrative is that office fires from debris caused it to symmetrically collapse at near free fall speeds, which is scientifically impossible. President Bush at the time even admitted that explosives were used. He told us the operatives had been instructed to ensure that the explosives went off at a, high po a point that was high enough to prevent people trapped above from escaping. We know that explosive residue was found in the van of the dancing Israelis. Well, another urban moving systems van got caught, but this one was full of explosives. They also tried to blow up the George Washington Bridge. There was a bolo, which is a be on the lookout for a particular van with there's supposed to be a few occupants in there. And the bolo basically stated that this van may be on its way to destroy the George Washington Bridge or something like that, if I remember correctly, and blow up the bridge. The FBI has now put out a nationwide APB all points bulletin for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration. Written on the back is Urban Moving Systems. Two or three men arrested on the New Jersey Parkway. Deborah, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Uh, that is the information that I'm getting from two sources, that there was a van either on the New Jersey Turnpike or the Garden State Parkway, and that it was near the George Washington Bridge. There were two or three men who were in the van. The van was pulled over. Uh, it is not clear why the van was pulled over, but when it was, uh, law enforcers found uh, uh, tons of explosives inside of the van. But some very um, intelligent and aggressive cops also stopped another terrorist attack from happening on the George Washington Bridge. CBS2 has learned exclusively that two men are in custody tonight after being arrested at the George Washington Bridge with an entire truckload of explosives. Now I'm told that those explosives could have been enough to blow up the entire span and all the cars and the people that were on it. And word late tonight that two suspects are in FBI custody after a truckload of explosives was discovered around the George Washington Bridge. That bridge uh, links uh, New York to New Jersey over the Hudson River. Whether the discovery of those explosives had anything to do with other events today is unclear, but the FBI has two suspects in hand, said the truck uh, load of explosives, enough explosives were in the truck to do great damage to the George Washington Bridge. I was watching the towers, and though I wasn't the closest, I saw them crumble to the earth like they were full of explosives. And they thought nobody noticed the news report that they did about the bombs planted on the George Washington Bridge. Four non-Arabs arrested during the emergency, and then it disappeared from the news permanently. They dubbed the tape of Osama, and they said it was proof. Jealous of our freedom, I can't believe you bought that excuse. The George Washington Bridge was owned by the Port Authority. Chairman of the Port Authority at the time of 9-11 was Jewish billionaire Lou Eisenberg. He financed Trump's campaign and was later given the role of U.S. Ambassador to Italy. He bought himself a seat to Trump's inauguration, as did Israeli billionaire Sheldon Adelson. Jewish billionaires Silverstein and Eisenberg had property that was destroyed or was intended to be destroyed on 9-11. Urban Moving Systems, a Mossad front company, got arrested and explosive residue was found in their van. Another one of their vans was stopped, except this one was full of explosives that was set to blow up the George Washington Bridge. Was Lou Eisenberg a random guy in all this? Well, he's actually a Jewish Zionist billionaire. He strongly supports Israel. He was the chairman of the Port Authority who leased the World Trade Center to Silverstein and Lowy. He is very close to Trump, just as Silverstein is. It's a safe bet that he had foreknowledge as well. well in, the year, in, in the year 2000, Donald, you considered running for president. If, if, if you had done that and if you had been successful, what do you think uh, you'd be doing right now? 
Well, I, I'd be taking a very, very tough line, Alan. I mean, uh, you know, most people feel they know uh, uh, at least approximately the group of people that did this and where they are. But, um, boy, would you have to take a hard line on this. This just can't be tolerated, and it's got to be very, very stern. This is, as you and I were discussing before, Alan, this was probably worse than Pearl Harbor. This country is different today and and it's going to be different than it ever was for many years to come uh, i think that uh, i think that today um, was another expression of the strength of this country and the strength of democracy um, nations democracies don't go to war easily and they usually debate and argue uh, before they do sometimes they have to be bombed into going to war in fact, that's what happened in World War II. All of Europe had been conquered. You had to, uh, America was actually bombed in Pearl Harbor. Uh, uh, and, was, and that was a pivotal event that opened the eyes of Americans. And once their eyes were opened, they gathered the, the power that is available in this great free nation. And uh, the result was preordained. Uh, I think in a, in a similar way, the bombing of September 11th opened the eyes of uh, Americans to see the great conflict and the great danger that faces us. And once opened, then the, the overpowering uh, uh, will of the majority of the people of the United States, of the, the steamroller, is uh, inexorably moving to, to decide this battle. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that 9-11 was good for Israel. Israeli intelligence got arrested celebrating 9-11. Witnesses saw them hugging as so many people died. As Netanyahu told Congress in 2002, sometimes they have to be bombed into going to war. Israel bombed the United States on 9-11 to manipulate you into fighting their wars. That's all the info I can fit in one hour. Today we focused on how 9-11 was done and part two will focus on why it was done, as well as other connections Trump has to the Jewish state. Trump knows exactly what's going on, and he's covering up 9-11 for Israel. If you like this video, share or feel free to re-upload this onto your channel. If you want to support me, all I ask is that you sit down people close to you and show them this video. If you can show this to veterans, that's even better. I know it's an uphill battle, but we don't have much of a choice. Try to educate people on APAC, the Israeli lobby, and more importantly, the attack on the USS Liberty in 1967 when Israel murdered 34 Americans and wounded another 174. This was another false flag similar to 9-11, only it failed. Was it Israel's interest that caused them to bomb and kill 37 innocent Americans on the Liberty? It was a terrible, a terrible, terrible tragedy, and that's what happens when a spy ship spies. A terrible, a terrible, a terrible even tragedy. to your allies, I even to your allies. Right? They shouldn't be called an ally. They don't deserve it. Four days into the 1967 Six-Day War, these men witnessed and survived one of the most deadliest attacks on an American vessel by a close U.S. ally, Israel. The torpedo entered the ship right about here. Forty-two years ago, Israeli jet fighter planes and torpedo boats bombarded an American intelligence Navy ship, the USS Liberty, with a series of attacks. The assault lasted two hours. According to survivors, killed 34 crewmen, injured over 170 others, and nearly sunk the ship. The whole story of it being a, an accident is just not true. Although for decades the Israelis insist the incident was a case of friendly fire, the victims of the attack confirmed the Israelis were fully aware they were attacking an American ship. Israel claims that they were not flying a flag and that uh, was a mistaken identity, but I know for myself that we were flying a flag. A lot of it we believe was covered up, uh, that it was an intentional act by Israel to sink the ship with all hands, no survivors. Why do you think they would have bombed the ship? Their next plan was to attack the Golan Heights. So the troops they had in, in, on the Sinai now had to be moved to take the Golan Heights. Um, the fact that the Israelis were massacring um, Egyptian troops, Egyptian 
prisoners of war. They had so many of them, and once again, they wanted to move all the troops they could to the Syrian border, and uh, they really could, they couldn't handle the, the, the Egyptian prisoners of war. So they massacred them. So it's perceived that they thought that we were intercepting the fact that that happened. This is a provocative act of war, would you not agree? Oh, yes, definitely. What, what happened? How did the U.S. react when this happened? Uh, USS Saratoga, which was some, I can't tell you how many miles away, but it was several miles away, launched aircraft to come to our aid once we got the Mayday signal out. Uh, and those jets were recalled uh, by McNamara, I believe. Uh, they relaunched, and the second wave was called back by President Johnson himself. That he did not want, for whatever reason, did not want the U.S. involved in this on our side. What do you think that is? Because I think Israel has too much money and they can have too many controlling interests in our government. I know there was a conspiracy between our government and Israel at the time, so uh, that's the reason why they didn't they didn't pursue it and why the the in investigations and the interrogations were done and, and covered up because of the because of the alliance between Israel and the United States, which I think is is wrong. I, I don't care who they are, uh, you just don't slap a hand for killing 34 guys and wounding over 172 people on board a ship for for no apparent reason. As far as I'm concerned, it's just outright murder. And so 42 years after the Israelis bombed an American warship, the survivors of the USS Liberty are still demanding justice. They say they will continue to raise awareness about a provocative act of war that the United States not only refused to respond to, but also helped cover up. Now, I have two comments on my deep respect for human life, okay? I'm opposed to our wasting our military in the Middle East on behalf of Zionist Israel. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let, let me just tell you that Israel is a very, very important ally of the United States, and we are going to protect them 100%. 100%. They've been our most reliable, uh, it's our true friend over there, and we're going to protect Israel 100 percent. What we need to stand up and say is not only did they attack the USS Liberty, they did 9-11. They didn't. I have had long conversations over the past two weeks with contacts at the Army War College at its headquarters Marine Corps. And I've made it absolutely clear in both cases that it is 100% certain that 9-11 was a Mossad operation, period. First, the disbelief. And what I show them immediately afterwards is an interview with a demolitions expert named Danny Jowenko. And it shows the third building at the World Trade Center going down. And they look at that, and I said, now you understand that if one of the buildings was wired for demolition, all of them were wired for demolition. And that's it. That's the tipping point. Getting into arguments about who was flying what and where they were and whether there was nanothermite, those things are true, but they're incidental. The thing that's necessary is to tell people three buildings went down, the third was not hit by a plane, it was wired for controlled demolition, therefore all of them were wired for controlled demolition. And at that point, the reaction is rage. First disbelief and then rage. 9-11 has led directly to 60,000 Americans dead and wounded. God knows how many hundreds of thousands of people in other countries that we've killed or wounded or made homeless. This is an open wound. And what Americans need to understand is they did it. They did it. And if they do understand that, Israel's going to disappear. Israel will flat-ass disappear from this earth. I sent a film to one of my colleagues, and it basically had Americans grieving over their dead, coming back. And I showed one of them, it was a woman, just wrenched by grief, you know, over, over her dead soldier. And I said, you know, if Americans ever know, ever know that Israel did this, they're going to scrub them off the earth, and they're not going to give a rat's ass what the cost is. They are not going to care. 
the first thing marked is astonishment. They didn't know. They, they truly didn't know. And these are not unintelligent people. They really didn't know. And the next statement is rage. Real rage. The Zionists are playing this as truly an all or nothing exercise. Because if they lose this one, if the American people ever realize what happened, they're done. The military has not been bought. The military is loyal, but it has not been bought. And if it ever understands this, really, really deeply understands this, and this is what I got when I put some of these things to the Army War College and to headquarters of the Marine Corps, I mentioned to a contact at headquarters of the Marine Corps, I said, you know they did 9-11. And it was, you don't mean it. I said, absolutely. And if they ever understand that, these people are history. And I said, what's going on? And who knows what it is? You know the famous Trojan horse. I mean, is this a Trojan horse? I doubt it, but it could very well be. And they don't have paperwork. They have no documentation whatsoever. They have no documentation. And then we're bringing them into this country. We don't know who they are. And you look at what happens in California, and you look at some of the things that happen, including, by the way, flying airplanes into the World Trade Center. Why are we doing this? Build a safe zone in Syria. Get the Gulf states who have a tremendous amount of money. I mean, Saudi Arabia was making a billion dollars a day before the oil went down. So now they're making half, okay? They're making a lot. Get them to pay. They're not paying. The other ones aren't paying. We're paying. We always pay. We're the sucker. We're the sucker. We're like the stupid sucker. And we're not going to pay anymore for all this stuff. And anybody that comes in, if I win, they're going back out. We're going to do it humanely and everything, but they're going back out. We don't know where they are. We don't know who they are, where they come from. And we've already had some. You saw the couple that came in from Iraq, where they were already planning different things. One in California, one in Houston, I believe. And they're planning things. No, we don't need it. We got enough problems, folks. We got enough problems. We got enough problems. So I, I read this the other day, and I said, wow, that's really amazing. That's really incredible. And it's uh, the snake lyric. On her way to work one morning, down the path along the lake, a tender-hearted woman saw a poor, half-frozen snake. Interesting. His pretty colored skin had been all frosted with the dew. Oh well, she cried, I'll take you in, and I'll take care of you. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Sighed the vicious snake. She wrapped him up cozy in a curvature of silk and then laid him by the fireside with some honey and some milk. Now she hurried home from work and that night as soon as she arrived she found that pretty snake she taken and revived. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. Now she clutched him to her bosom. You're so beautiful, she cried. But if I hadn't brought you in, by now you might have died. She stroked his pretty skin, and then she kissed and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. Take me in, O oh tender woman. Take me in, for heaven's sake. Take me in, O oh tender woman, sighed the vicious snake. I saved you, cried the woman, and you've bit me, heavens why. You know your bite is poisonous, and now I'm going to die. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Does that make sense to anybody? Does that make any sense? You knew damn well I was a snake before you took me in. Does that make sense to anybody? Does that make any sense? 
When the economy and the real estate market plummeted in 1990, attorney Alan Pomerant says Trump owed $4 billion to his debtors, including that billion dollars for which he was personally responsible. Because he personally guaranteed so much debt, the leverage shifted dramatically over to the banks because it was no longer an issue of a bank and a piece of real estate. It was a bank and Donald Trump's actual survival. Trump owed money all over town to 72 banks in all. Pomerantz represented them as a group. How close was he to going personally bankrupt? Very. Trump makes a point of saying he never went personally bankrupt. But there's a reason why the banks decided to keep Trump whole. We made the decision that he would be worth more alive to us than dead. In the 90s, Donald Trump was bailed out by Rothschild Inc. Wilbur Ross, senior managing director of Rothschild, is now Commerce Secretary of the United States. The Rothschilds, one of the wealthiest families in the world, founded Israel. The Balfour Declaration in 1917, Britain signed over Palestine to Walter Rothschild to create a Jewish state. This is the desk where the Balfour Declaration was composed and written. Funny you should say that. <laughs> and here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. Uh, if you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. We love Israel. We will fight for Israel 100%, 1,000%. It will be there forever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We kept him alive to help us. Not only is Trump being financed today by Jewish billionaires, but he was also bailed out by the Rothschilds who founded Israel. He's not playing them. He has been close to them for a very long time. We know today that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction. Who lied about Iraq having WMDs and convinced Congress to support preemptively bombing Iraq? And every indication we have is that he is uh, pursuing pursuing with uh, abandon, pursuing with every uh, ounce of effort the uh, establishment of, uh, uh, of uh, map weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons. There is no question whatsoever that Saddam is seeking and is working and is advancing towards the development of nuclear weapons. No question whatsoever. I have to say that in the history of democracies, Preemption has been, in my mind, the most difficult choice for leaders to make. Because at the time of the decision, you can never prove the critics wrong. You can never show them the great catastrophe that was avoided by preemptive action. And yet we now know that had the democracies taken preemptive action to, to bring down Hitler uh, in the 1930s, the worst horrors in history could have been avoided. I think uh, your statement, which is very eloquent, boils down to one thing, and that is, do we react to another attack on America after hundreds of thousands or millions of lives have been lost, or do we preempt that kind of action from happening in the first place? And I think you made a very strong case today that we should support President Bush and respond before it happens. The main reason we went into Iraq at the time was we thought he had weapons of mass destruction. It turns out he didn't, but he had the capacity to make weapons of mass destruction. But I also talked about the human suffering in Iraq. The terrorists attacked us and killed 3,000 of our citizens before we started the freedom agenda in the Middle East. They were. What did Iraq have to do with what? The attack on the World Trade Center. Nothing. Israel lied about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction, 
and that Iraq was harboring terrorists. Where did these lies originate? Of uh, Saddam's attempts to conceal and deceive uh, the world, to conceal the uh, efforts that he's making at producing weapons of mass destruction. We in Israel have known this for a long time. In 1981, Netanyahu wrote a book called International Terrorism, advocating for the West, led by the United States, to wage war against Iraq on the basis of weapons of mass destruction. He also pushed for war with Libya and Iran. He wrote all of this 20 years before Bush was in office. Israel knew Iraq had no weapons of mass destruction. Yozi Sarid, member of the Israeli Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in 2004, admitted it was known in Israel the story that weapons of mass destruction could be activated in 45 minutes was an old wives tale. I think an old wives tale is the best way to describe it. The Iraq war is often described as the greatest intelligence failure in living memory. Well, who gave that intelligence to the United States? To conceal the uh, efforts that he's making at producing weapons of mass destruction, we in Israel have known this for a long time. We've shared this intelligence with the United States. You have uh, some evidence to that effect. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was asked the same question in, uh, in 1986. I had uh, uh, written uh, a book in which I had said uh, that the way to deal with uh, terrorist uh, regimes, well, with terror, was to deal with the terrorist regimes. And the way to deal with the terrorist regimes, among other things, was to uh, apply military force against them. To the in 1986, Netanyahu wrote another book. This one is called Terrorism, How the West Can Win. He wrote about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction again, and also advocated for the West to wage war against Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. With the exception of Cuba, all of this is happening today. All this was launched just more than a week after 9-11. And right after 9-11, about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. He picked up a piece of paper and he said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. But September 11th put it in a different light, and taking on that tyrant forcefully um, meant in fact, if anything, that we had to take that threat more seriously. So all three of those concerns are stated in Secretary Powell's testimony. Now, I talked about I the mistreatment of the people. Let me could interrupt because my time is limited, unfortunately. You just said that this is uh, that 10 years ago you wouldn't have agreed to uh, a regime change. However, in 1998, you as a member of the New American Century sent a letter to President Senator, Clinton. I said something different. Well, I no, said wait a sec. You were saying we're seeing it in the light of September 11th. That's just not true. You've been advocating for regime change all through the late 90s. And in this letter, the... the hey, can I explain? There's a very clear difference. The strategy should aim, above all, this is 1998, the strategy should aim, above all, at the removal of Saddam Hussein's regime from power. You signed that letter. Former Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, pushed for war against Iraq in 1998 claiming that they were going to use weapons of mass destruction on Israel. He was also involved in planning the countries to wage war against after 9-11, as General Wesley Clark revealed. Paul Wolfowitz is an Israeli-American dual citizen. He lived in Israel when he was 14. He gets in a position where he heavily influences U.S. foreign policy and is openly planning wars for the security of Israel. This comes at the cost of American lives and trillions of dollars of American taxpayer money. He wasn't pushing the people of Israel to fight a war against Iraq. He got the Americans to fight that war instead. Israeli propagandist Dennis Prager even admitted that the United States is fighting wars for Israel. And I don't think anyone has explained it better than he has. We Jews are the world's miners' canary. 
In 1973, I was on a St. Louis radio station during the Arab oil embargo. And a non-Jewish caller called up and he said the following. He said, you know, I don't understand. You Jews seem to be the tail that wags the dog. You want America to take great concern over the Jews of Russia and exacerbate tensions with the other superpower? You want us to help Israel and have hostile, therefore more hostile relations with those who have our oil? What gives with you Jews? Are you the tail that wags the dog? It took the World Trade Center bombing to take Hamas seriously in America. It's too bad. Maybe had we taken it seriously sooner, a few families would have had their fathers and brothers and sons in New York. My friends, the enemies of Israel are not the Boy Scouts of the world. The enemies of Israel is Iran, which is destroying its Baha'is, Sudan, which actually crucifies blacks. New York Times article a couple of months ago, but didn't get to see that on CNN. Iraq, which, which is a living concentration camp for its own people, Syria, which destroyed 20,000 of its own citizens in just one fairly well-known operation a few years ago. Hamas, whose agenda is the destruction of anyone who opposes their theocracy. Those are the enemies of Israel. They are also the enemies of good people. It is not a position we Jews asked for, but when we make this known to non-Jews, they will understand why we are here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Valerie Plain, former CIA operative, linked to an article on Twitter today titled, I want to read this, America's Jews are driving America's wars. Former CIA officer Valerie Plame tweeted an article called America's Jews are driving America's wars. This sparked controversy and she was forced to resign from the Plowshares Fund. That article was actually written by Philip Giraldi who is another former CIA officer. He also wrote about the Israelis being arrested for filming and celebrating as the first tower was hit. Back to the original article. Giraldi writes that most of the neoconservatives who control US foreign policy are Jewish. He goes on to list many of their names. Nearly all the Iran haters are Jewish. David Frum, Max Boot, Bill Crystal, Brett Stevens. And I would like to add a few more names. Mark Dubowitz, Michael Ledeen, Rule Mark Garrett of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Daniel Pipes of the Middle East Forum, John Potteretz of Commentary Magazine, Elliot Abrams of the Council on Foreign Relations, May Rab Wormser of the Middle East Research Institute, Kimberly Kagan of the Institute for the Study of War, Frederick Kagan, Daniel Pletka, and David Wormser of the American Enterprise Institute. And yep, they're all Jewish. Plus, most of them would self-describe as neoconservatives. And I might add that only one of the named individuals has ever served in any branch of the American military. One might also add that neocons as a group were founded by Jews and are largely Jewish, hence their universal attachment to the state of Israel. Paul Wolfowitz, Doug Fife, and Scooter Libby. Yes, all Jewish and all conduits for the false information that led to a war that has spread and effectively destroyed much of the Middle East, except for Israel of course. Philip Zelikow, also Jewish, in a moment of candor, admitted that the Iraq war, in his opinion, was fought for Israel. Is anyone providing an alternative viewpoint to eternal and uncritical support for Benjamin Netanyahu and his kleptocratic regime of racist thugs? I think not. After writing this article, Giraldi was fired by the American conservative where he had been a regular contributor for 14 years. That brought us low economically, morally. We went to war against a guy who had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11. It was a total pretext. 
it's it's inexplicable and there you go to Cheney there you go yeah. to Bush there you go to the Jewish neocons who wanted to remake uh, the world maybe I can say that because I'm Jewish and uh, to bring about a I, certain I'm result not really in the sure Middle that East you can okay I'm not really, <laughs> sure, that, I'm not really sure that you <laughs> go, can go ahead most of the neoconservatives who control US foreign policy are in fact Jewish this is even admitted in one of the biggest Israeli news outlets, Haaretz. Israel is not burdened with trillions of dollars of debt. The United States is. We American Jews have the most extraordinary rights in this remarkable country. With those rights comes responsibilities. On our Independence Line, John, good morning for Michael Schwer. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, for one, am sick and tired of all these uh, Jews coming on C-SPAN and other stations and pushing us to go to war against our Muslim friends. They're, they're willing to spend the last drop of American blood and treasure to get their way in the world. They have way too much power in this country. People like Wolfowitz and Fife and the other neocons that Jewed us into Iraq, and now we're going to spend the next 60 years rehabilitating our soldiers. I'm sick and tired of it. John in uh, Franklin, New York. Any comments? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, of course, American foreign policy is eventually up to the American people. Uh, the w one of the big things that we've not been able to discuss in this country for the last 30 years is our policy toward the Israelis. Uh, whether we want to be involved in fighting Israel's wars uh, in the future is something that Americans should be able to talk about. They may vote yes. They may want to see their kids killed in Iraq or Yemen or somewhere else to protect Israel. Uh, but the question is we need to talk about it. Ultimately, Israel as a country is of no particular worth to the United States. It doesn't you mean strategic strategically? Strategically. No, they have no resources we need. Their manpower is minimal. Um, their association with us is um, a negative for the United States. Now that's that's a fact. IASPS is a Jerusalem-based think tank with an office in Washington, D.C. for its Israeli-American dual citizens. In 1996, they wrote the Clean Break Policy Paper for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This called for the destabilization of Iraq and Syria. In 2001, three of them got top positions in the Bush administration Richard Pearl, Chairman of the Defense Policy Board, Douglas Fife, Under Secretary of Defense, David Wormser, Middle East Advisor to Dick Cheney. This was a study group on a new Israeli strategy towards 2000. Benjamin Netanyahu's government comes in with a new set of ideas. Work closely with Turkey and Jordan to contain, destabilize, and roll back some of its most dangerous threats. This implies a clean break from the slogan, Comprehensive Peace, to a traditional concept of strategy based on a balance of power. Israel can shape its strategic environment in cooperation with Turkey and Jordan by weakening, containing, and even rolling back Syria. This effort can focus on removing Saddam Hussein from power, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Israeli citizens working in the U.S. government officially planned the wars in Iraq and Syria for the interest of Israel in 1996 and 1998. If this is all too hard to believe, Douglas Fife admits the clean break policy paper is legit on his own website. He just puts all the blame on David Wormser. David's wife, Mayrab Wormser, another one of the authors, was interviewed by BBC about the clean break and she also confirmed its legitimacy. Done in a think tank um, uh, by a group of people. Um, yes, many of us are Jewish. There's no need to apologize for that. Um, uh, most of us, all of us, in fact, are pro-Israel. Uh, some of us more fiercely so than, the, than, than others. Well, that, that paper in 1996, the, the King Break paper, that was the paper that led to accusations of, of dual loyalty. There is no dual loyalty. President Nixon disallowed Jewish advisors from discussing Israel policy. 
Nixon ordered his aides to exclude all Jewish Americans from policy making on Israel, according to formally classified notes taken by then Chief of Staff H.R. Bob Haldeman on a meeting with the President in July 1971. No Jew can handle the Israeli thing. Forget the Jews. They're against the administration. People may call Nixon an anti-Semite, but he was right. Listening in agreement is the Reverend Billy Graham. Iraq was, it was the perfect test case for to, to create a, a vibrant democracy in the heart of the Arab world. I mean, this is a basically educated population. Um, we completely underestimated the level of sectarianism there. Um, but again, that is easily as, as, ascribed to incompetence. Sam Harris and other idiots will claim that Iraq was invaded to spread democracy and that the disastrous outcome was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake, that was the intended policy, to destabilize the country. Dick Cheney even admitted in 1994 that he knew Iraq would be destabilized if Saddam was taken out, and they did it anyway. Do you think that the U.S. or U.N. forces should have moved into Baghdad? No. Why not? Uh, once you got to Iraq and took it over and took down Saddam Hussein's government, then what are you going to put in its place? That's a very volatile part of the world, and, and if you take down the central government in Iraq, you can easily end up seeing pieces of Iraq fly off. Uh, part of it uh, the Syrians would like to have to the west. Uh, part of eastern Iraq uh, the Iranians would like to claim fought over for eight years. In the north, you've got the Kurds, and if the Kurds spin loose and join with the Kurds in Turkey, then you've threatened the territorial integrity of Turkey. It's a, it's a quagmire if you go that far and try to take <laughs> over Iraq. If you take out Saddam, Saddam's regime, I guarantee you, that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. The goal for both of them, the goal for the United States, is twofold. As I've stated, it's one, to make sure that we destabilize Syria. I needed to make sure that I clarified uh, and, and not was any, in any way, shape, or form any more of a distraction from the president's decisive action in Syria and the attempts that he's making to destabilize the region. AFEC Oil and Gas confirmed that major oil reserves were found in the Golan Heights. AFEC Oil and Gas is a subsidiary of Genie Energy. Genie Energy's strategic advisory board includes Fox News' Rupert Murdoch and Jacob Rothschild, whose family founded Israel. Another board member is former Vice President Dick Cheney, who played a major role in destabilizing the Middle East. The Golan Heights is Syrian territory that is illegally occupied by Israel. It was stolen from Syria during the Six-Day War when Israel preemptively attacked Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and the United States. You'll often hear that the Arabs tried to drive the Jews into the sea. That is a proven lie. The Israelis tried to drive Americans into the sea with rockets and napalm. It's no longer tolerable to take someone else's land by force. Hitler occupied Poland, then Britain and France declared a world war. Israel has occupied all of its neighbors. Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, slaughtering civilians in the process, while world leaders look the other way. The president of Jini, Ephraim Etam, is actually a Jewish supremacist. As an Israeli lawmaker in the Knesset, he publicly called for expelling Palestinians from the West Bank, which is their own land, their private property, and turn it into a place where only Jewish people can live. He was never reprimanded and continued working for the Israeli government for years. Afterwards, he went on to make millions. If you're Jewish, you're allowed to say racist and xenophobic things. But if you criticize Jews, they ruin your career. This is Jewish privilege. After saying Jews are responsible for all the wars in the world, Mel Gibson knew that day that his life was fucked. General Energy controls the oil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. General Energy was founded by Nathaniel Rothschild. So Israel officially plans to destabilize Iraq and Syria. Then the founding family of Israel owns oil companies in both countries. Israel actually gets 77% of its oil from Iraqi Kurdistan. I think a more appropriate title would be 
After Saddam removed from power, Israel got 77% of its oil from Iraq. Sometimes you have to ask yourself who benefits. Israel clearly benefited from overthrowing Saddam. Meanwhile, it was one of the greatest strategic disasters in American history. That was American blood being spilled. That oil is going to Israel. And don't forget about all the kids that the soldiers were manipulated into bombing. This was a disaster for Europe as well. Destabilizing Iraq and Syria for Israel created 13.6 million refugees. And that's just in 2014. The number is way higher now. Most of the refugees go to Europe, and none go to Israel, who was next door and started the conflict. Prior to the Islamic Revolution in 1979, when the Shah was overthrown, Israel got most of its oil from Iran by way of the Trans-Israel Pipeline. Israel also benefited as the pipeline would export oil through to Europe. If there's regime change in Iran, all that oil will start flowing to Israel again. The pipeline in Israel was actually financed by Baron Edmund Rothschild. What a coincidence. Netanyahu wants regime change in Iraq, Syria, and Iran. The founding family of Israel has oil interests in all three. There is a connection. Netanyahu worked for the Boston Consulting Group from 1976 to 1978. He worked with Michael Rothschild, who was there at the same time. Thanks to investigative journalist Christopher Wolin for this information. Now we're going to look at a strategy for Israel in the 1980s written by Israeli scholar Oded Yanan in 1982. Some of you may know this as the Oded Yanan Plan or the Greater Israel Project. This was translated to English by Professor Israel Shahak and published in a book titled The Zionist Plan for the Middle East. Iraq rich in oil on one hand and internally torn on the other. Every kind of inter-Arab confrontation will assist us. This is exactly what's happening today. Again, Israel plans to destabilize Iraq and Syria, then has oil companies operating in them. The dissolution of Syria and Iraq later on into ethnically or religiously unique areas such as Lebanon is Israel's primary target on the Eastern Front in the long run. In Iraq, a division into provinces along ethnic religious lines, as in Syria during Ottoman times is possible. So the three or more states will exist around the three major cities, Basra, Baghdad, and Mosul, and Shiite areas in the south will separate from the Sunni and Kurdish north. Retired Colonel Rolf Peters, who was a hardcore Zionist, published a map in the Armed Forces Journal in 2006 that suggested reimagining Middle Eastern borders on ethnic, sectarian, and tribal lines. Notice the Kurdish state in the north. Fighting between Iraq's rival factions splinters the country. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu voiced his support for Kurdish statehood. Regarding the Kurds, they are a fighting people that have proved their political commitment, political moderation, and deserve political independence. Smooth. Israel has quietly maintained military and intelligence ties with the Kurds for decades. Seeing in the minority ethnic group a buffer against shared Arab adversaries. We should support international efforts to strengthen Jordan and support the Kurdish aspiration for independence. Israel endorses Kurdish independence. With everything Israel has done to the Middle East, Iraq won't allow this to happen. The Kurdish independence referendum was successfully passed. This is Israeli strategic thinking, the idea that all Arab states should be broken down by Israel into small units. After 35 years, this is being accomplished. Iran closed its borders with Kurdistan out of respect for Iraq's territorial integrity. Syria rejects Kurdistan's referendum as it undermines Iraq's unity. Iraq announced sanctions on Kurdistan following the referendum. Turkey does not care about its neighbor's unity and has worked with Israel at the start of this conflict. They've been fighting with the Kurds for decades and don't want a Kurdish state beside them. Turkey is ready for war, which is what Israel and Cheney were expecting to happen. You will always be divided. And as long as you're divided, you'll be weak. And as long as you are weak, they'll steal your wealth. It's not rocket science. 
You don't have to be Einstein to work it out. Unity is strength. If you could only stop thinking like Sunni and Shia, like Lebanese and Syrian, like left and right, like Maghrebi or Levantine, if you could, or, or Gulfi, if you could only stop thinking like that. Imagine the strength that you could have if you came together. But as long as you are ready to sit and blame other people, you will never be united. And as long as you are not united, you will be divided. And as long as you are divided, they will steal your things. That's why they're doing it. They just care about dividing you. They just care about making you fight against each other. As long as you're fighting each other, you're not fighting them. You're not fighting Israel. You're allowing them to steal your oil, steal your gas, steal your water. This is Divide and Conquer. Israeli Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked admitted that Israel has major interest in a Kurdish state. She claims that the West does too. No, we don't. We need to stay the hell out of the Middle East. <laughs> The United States and Israeli governments have been arming ISIS to fight against Syria and its allies for much of the last six years. Now with ISIS diminishing, how do you keep the conflict going? Trump is arming the Kurds in Syria and Iraq, and Israel is now giving air support to the Kurds to fight against its neighbors. Trump is continuing Obama's foreign policy towards Israel, but far more hawkish. People actually thought this was going to change. Today I have the honor of welcoming my friend, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to the White House. With this visit, the United States again reaffirms our unbreakable bond with our cherished ally, Israel. And you would have Iran run Syria, a horrible prospect for us, or Daesh, which is also there, touching our borders on the Golan. When two of your enemies <clears throat> are fighting each other, I don't say strengthen one or the other, I say weaken both. Uh, or at least don't intervene, which is what I've done. I've not intervened. I have acted several years ago, and I think I was the first country to do that, to put uh, a military hospital 10 yards away from the, our border with the Golan, with Syria, Okay, you say no preference. There have been reports that Israel has been treating wounded Syrian rebel fighters in its yeah, hospitals yeah, on the border, yeah. including fighters from Nusra Front, yeah. uh, which is, of course, the Al-Qaeda proxy in Syria. Um, do those reports worry you that Israel's helping wounded Al-Qaeda-aligned fighters? As I said before, uh, in a different context, it's always useful also to deal with your enemies in a humane way. ISIS is beheading Muslims and Christians than receiving medical treatment from Israel. If they were attacking Jews, they would not be receiving medical treatment. The former director of Mossad goes on television claiming that these psychopaths who are beheading people deserve humane treatment because they have never attacked Israel. Al-Qaeda, to the best of my recollection, has up to now not attacked Israel. But has attacked your number one ally and protector and sponsor in the United States of America. There is a quote-unquote war on terror being going on for 15 years. The only time they attacked Israel was by accident and they apologized, which former defense minister Moshe Alon publicly admitted. When ISIS attacks superpowers like France or Britain, they don't apologize. Why do they travel thousands of miles to kill civilians in Europe when Israel is just a couple miles away? ISIS actually explained why it's not attacking Israel. The Islamic State said in its weekly newspaper that it has not focused on attacking Israel because it does not believe the Palestinian cause 
is more significant than other issues affecting Muslims. ISIS is burning Palestinian flags. ISIS is beheading and raping Palestinians. An ISIS leader was arrested in Libya and was discovered to be a Mossad agent. You tell the story about how you tried to find out what the what they call the Mossad when they deal with uh, I publicly? A, I thought it was a reasonable question, but the trouble is uh, you can't pick up the phone book. There's no uh, Langley in, uh, in Israel that you can look up you know, CIA or in our case uh, the Mossad. We thought we should ask what shall we call it in English? You can translate the Hebrew words, as I said, Mossad is Institute. But when they write a letter to their friends in the CIA or the British intelligence, what do they call themselves? It took a while. Uh, it was a matter of asking the prime minister's spokesman. The best you could do, because officially uh, the Mossad is under the prime minister's office. And uh, I think he sort of wondered why you want to know and all that, so we explained. And he came up with uh, the Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. I mean, if it were to have initials, it would be ISIS. It's not Israel's battle, it's your battle. It's the battle of France. Because it's the same battle. If they succeed here, if Israel is the one that's blamed here and not the terrorists, if we don't stand together, then this terror plague will come to you. It's just a question of time. It will come to you, it will come to France. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told French Jews Saturday after 17 people were killed there during three days of Islamist attacks that Israel is their home. In a televised statement, Netanyahu said, To all the Jews of France, all the Jews of Europe, I would like to say that Israel is not just the place in whose direction you pray. The state of Israel is your home. Media sources say that Netanyahu has also ordered a ministerial committee to convene next week to discuss ways to encourage immigration of French and other European Jews to Israel. ISIS and Israel both attack Palestinians. ISIS attacks Syrian forces. Israel airstrikes Syrian forces. ISIS attacks Hezbollah. Israel airstrikes Hezbollah. ISIS attacks all of Israel's enemies regularly but has never attacked Israel. Israel is supposedly the only democracy in the Middle East with Western values and freedom that these people hate. Look, ISIS got started through funding from our friends and allies, because as people will tell you in the region, if you want somebody who will fight to the death against Hezbollah, you don't put out a recruiting poster and say, you know, sign up for us, or we're going to make a better world. You go after zealots and you go after these religious fundamentalists. That's who fights Hezbollah. We have been fighting alongside al-Qaeda, fighting alongside ISIS. ISIS is now emboldened and in two countries. But here's the anomaly. We're with ISIS in Syria. We're on the same side of the war. When, when we started the war on terror after 9-11, it was essentially a war against al-Qaeda and sure. similar right. organizations. We have gone full circle from opposing Al-Qaeda, complete circle to where we now supply them, we arm them, we finance them, and it's all coming uh, with, with the approval of the highest authorities in the United States government. Uh, I think every American would be um, surprised to know that for years uh, our government has been providing both direct and indirect support uh, to these armed militant groups who are working uh, directly with or, or even under the command of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, all in their, our, their effort and fight to overthrow the Syrian government. Uh, our bill does a simple thing, and it says that our taxpayer dollars should not be used. They already reject that. ISIL. Do you know any major Arab ally that embraces ISIL? I know major Arab allies who fund them. I mean, it was very clear what we, were, what we were going to face. Well, I admire your frankness very on this clear subject. what we were going to let face. Me, let me just, to one before we move on, just to clarify once more, you are basically saying that even in government at the time, you knew those groups were around, you saw this analysis, sure. and you were arguing against it. But who wasn't listening? I think, uh, I think the administration. 
the administration turned a blind eye to your analysis? I don't know if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. Hillary Clinton has described already the meeting in the White House over two years ago. Everyone in the national security team recommended uh, arming ISIS. Was moving too slowly, but the fall of Ramadi has galvanized the Iraqi government. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, other Gulf states, Turkey, Jordan, ourselves, Britain, France, all fund, train, support, and ultimately are responsible for these monsters running around in their latest branded name, ISIS, which I will repeat a third time stands for Israeli Secret Intelligence Service. While serving as defense minister, Mashallah said that he prefers ISIS, terrorists that are going around beheading people, to be in control of Syria, instead of the Syrian government who is allied with Iran. The Israeli government wants ISIS to keep destabilizing Syria and continue pushing refugees to Europe. In 2015, Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman publicly called for disloyal Israeli Arabs to be beheaded. That is essentially what ISIS is doing. After Yalan resigned, Netanyahu asked Lieberman to become the new defense minister, and he accepted. Professor, you, you suggested the rather controversial idea that ISIL, for example, which operates both in Syria and in Iraq, should be weakened, but... Uh still should be kept alive as a strategic tool that would allow to uh, put pressure on what you call bad guys. And by bad guys, you mean Iran, Hezbollah, but also Syria and Russia. Um, if that's indeed the strategy, do you think we then will have to accept uh, the attacks like the one that happened in Manchester a short while ago as an attendant cost of it? Well, first of all, I'm happy you are reading my, my articles. It's true that uh, I have advocated that uh, the campaign against ISIS is problematic because we are uh, weakening an anti-Iranian uh, actor in, uh, in the region. And also, uh, we uh, undermine uh, the ability of the opposition forces in Syria to uh, um, end this uh, Assad uh, regime. I, what I'm saying simply is to save our efforts vis-a-vis uh, ISIS and concentrate on the larger threat, which is Iran. So uh, do I understand you correctly that uh, I within your framework, the 22 people who died in Manchester were, you know, collateral damage to that strategy? I you know, it's... it's tr terrible, but people are dying in large numbers in the Middle East, so something like that will have to be accepted. Professor Ephraim Inbar actually published an article for an Israeli think tank claiming that the destruction of ISIS is a strategic mistake. While acknowledging ISIS has killed thousands taking over cities and beheading people on video, in his mind the continuing existence of ISIS serves a strategic purpose because they are breaking down Syria. Breaking down the Arab states is Israeli strategic thinking. The 1982 Oded Yanan plan has undoubtedly been aided by ISIS. Kurds are Israel's tool to break up Iraq, which is heating up. ISIS has been Israel's tool to break up Syria to the point where Ram Ben Barak, Director General of Israel's Intelligence Ministry, is calling for the partition of Syria along sectarian lines as the only possible solution. Any arrangement that is struck in Syria, if one is achievable, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Humpty Dumpty can be put back together again. I have strong doubts. I'm not sure Syria as a state can be reconstituted. So you have not only Ram Ben Barak, but also Netanyahu calling for Syria to be balkanized. This is what happened with Yugoslavia during the 90s. When a powerful leader like Tito was in charge, multiple ethnic groups lived side by side in peace. After he died, these groups wanted to be independent and drop their own lines on the map. Problem is, there are resources there. Groups began fighting over what they thought they were entitled to, then after much bloodshed the country was partitioned into multiple states. This is exactly what Israel wants to do with Iraq and Syria. You bring down a powerful enemy, 
then steal the resources as the people are busy fighting with each other. Israel orchestrated the overthrow of Saddam, helped the Kurds gain independence, and are now arming them to fight against their neighbors. The situation in Yugoslavia is playing out in Iraq, where people who coexisted are now killing each other. Israeli Deputy Minister for Diplomacy, Michael Oren, said back in April, With Syria in pieces, it's time to recognize Israel's annexation of the Golan. Everything's starting to make sense. So what do you think of my Trump home mattress collection by Serta? Finally, the same luxury and comfort I demand in my hotels. Oh, they'll never count sheep again. Listen, why don't you come work for me? What do you have in mind? Something you were born to do. Welcome to room nine. Looking good, number nine, looking good. Where's your dignity? Save now on this Trump Home Luxury Suites mattress during the Serta Luxury Suites Savings Event, now through Labor Day. Come on, one. You and I are actually a lot alike. We're both in the sleep business. Uh -huh. We both work really hard. Sure. And we both wear wool suits. Where does the greater Israel aspect of this plan come from? First, we have to go back to Professor Israel Shahak's book where he sources Herzl's own writings. In his Complete Diaries, Volume 2, page 711, Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, says that the area of the Jewish state stretches from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates. The Promised Land isn't just Palestine. It includes Iraq and Syria. Herzl's quote is based on Genesis 15, 18. So the Lord made a covenant with Abraham that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. Israeli Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked confirms this. Ayelet Shaked is actually a Jewish extremist. In 2014, she called for the genocide of Palestinians on Facebook. She wrote, They are all enemy combatants, and their blood shall be on all their heads. Now this includes the mothers of the martyrs who send them to hell with flowers and kisses. They should follow their sons. Nothing would be more just. They should go, as should the physical homes in which they raise the snakes. Otherwise, more little snakes will be raised there. Instead of being reprimanded for this, Netanyahu promoted her to justice minister, just as he's done with other religious psychopaths. Fifteen countries in the Security Valley. Council so if, just if, passed if, a resolution. Fourteen if, of them voted <laughs> against you, and America abstained. Not a single country voted with you. N the you, EU, the UN, the Russians, the Chinese, what, the let, US, let, they let's all do a view this as an illegal occupation and illegal settlement. You are completely isolated on the issue of occupation and settlement. You know that, Naftali. Madi, I, I guess what you need to do is go uh, back and change the Bible. You need to change the narrative of the Bible because it's all there. If you want to uh, say that our land does not belong to us, I, I suggest you go change the Bible first, come back and then show me a new Bible that says that the land of Israel doesn't belong to Jews. Okay. And King David ruled from Jerusalem. This holy book, the Bible, contains 3,000 years of history of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. No one, no one can change this history. Let's take a look at King David's empire at the time of his death. Israel is described as the area under direct central administration. Iraq and Syria are described as dominions and vassal states under the kingdom's economic control, but not parts of the kingdom proper. That is clearly what they are trying to accomplish in Iraq and Syria today. And as you've just seen, the Israeli government openly believes that God promised that land to them. Is defining the future of Israel. And their stated purpose is clear. They believe in one state, Greater Israel. In an interview with ABC's John Miller in 1998, Osama bin Laden explained why he declared jihad on the United States. 
We know at least one reason behind the symbolic participation of Western forces, and that is to support the Jewish and Zionist plans for expansion of what is called the Great Israel. Surely, their presence is not out of concern over their interests in the region. Their presence has no meaning to save anyone, and that is to offer support to the Jews in Palestine, who are in need of their Christian brothers to achieve full control over the Arab Peninsula, which they intend to make an important part of the so-called Greater Israel. You don't have to like Osama, but he was actually telling the truth. He was aware of the plan for a Greater Israel, which has killed over 2 million of his people. After watching the next few clips, you'll understand why Israel framed Osama bin Laden for 9-11. Mr. Bin Laden, you have declared a jihad against the United States. Can you tell us why? The U.S. government has committed acts that are extremely unjust, hideous, and criminal through its support of the Israeli occupation of Palestine. And we believe the U.S. is directly responsible for those killed in Palestine, Lebanon, and Iraq. Due to its subordination to the Jews, the arrogance of the United States regime has reached the point that they occupied Arabia, the holiest place of the Muslims, who are more than a billion people in the world today. For this and other acts of aggression and injustice, we have declared jihad against the U.S. The U.S. today has set a double standard calling whoever goes against its injustice a terrorist. It wants to occupy our countries, steal our resources, impose agents on us to rule us, and then wants us to agree to all this. If we refuse to do so, it says we are terrorists. When Palestinian children throw stones against the Israeli occupation, the U.S. says they are terrorists. Whereas when Israel bombed the United Nations building in Lebanon, while it was full of children and women, the U.S. stopped any plan to condemn Israel. But I wrote a very political book years ago in the year 2000, The America We Deserve, and I said in that book that we better be careful with this guy named Osama bin Laden. I mean, I really study this stuff. I really find it very interesting. And even though I'm a businessman, I find it, I've always found, I always have been involved in politics. I said... We better be careful with Osama bin Laden. There's a guy named Osama bin Laden. Nobody really knew who he was, but he was nasty. He was saying really nasty things about our country and what he wants to do to it. And I wrote in the book, 2000, two years before the World Trade Center came down, I talked about Osama bin Laden. You better take him out. I said, he's going to crawl under a rock. You better take him out. And now people are seeing that. They're saying, you know, Trump predicted Osama bin Laden, which actually is true. And then two years later, a year and a half later, he knocked down the World Trade Center. When he walks into the room and you realize this guy is 6'3 or 6'4, um, he never raises his voice. Um, he doesn't pound the table or use his fist. He's not a fiery orator. He's soft-spoken. But the words, the words he was using, uh, were extremely powerful and frightening. He had three principal issues. One was to remove the U.S. military presence from Saudi Arabia. The other was to end the U.S. support of Israel, uh, particularly as it affected negatively the Palestinians. And three was, at that time, an immediate halt to the bombing of Iraq, and even still now today, uh, an end to sanctions that he felt um, adversely affected Iraqi women and children and, and, and innocents. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children then died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Congress, if, if Congress were given an opportunity to vote on whether we should bomb Iraq, would you go along with that as long as it, it went through the, the procedures? No, I would strongly oppose it because they're not a threat to our national security. Uh, Iraq has a third-rate army. They have no ability to wage war. Our policies are deliberately destroying the country. They can't feed their children. They're not allowed to have medication. There was a story in today's paper where one of our private charity groups was being fined because they were trying to get medicines in to the Iraqi people. The UN reported that as many as 576,000 Iraqi children 
may have died since the end of the Persian Gulf War because of sanctions. Saddam invaded Kuwait and lost the war, but sanctions were kept going because of the lie that he had weapons of mass destruction. Israel knew Saddam had no WMDs. They destroyed his nuclear reactor in 1981, also killing French scientists in the process. Netanyahu wrote about sanctioning Iraq in all three of his books. Let's take a look at his 1995 book, Fighting Terrorism. Even though over half a million children were starved to death, he calls the sanctions a measurable success. Remember that 1998 PNAC document calling for regime change in Iraq? Well, the Project for a New American Century was founded by Bill Kristol and Robert Kagan, who are both American Jews. In 1998, they wrote an article titled, Bombing Iraq Isn't Enough. It is clear that Mr. Hussein wants his weapons of mass destruction more than he wants oil revenue or relief for hungry Iraqi children. They knew there were no weapons of mass destruction. They were intentionally starving those children to death. These psychopaths will often bring up the Holocaust and use that to play the victim while they starve to death hundreds of thousands of children. They also wrote, If five weeks of heavy bombing in 1991 failed to knock him out, five days of bombing won't either. Can the air attacks ensure that he will never be able to use weapons of mass destruction again? The answer unfortunately is no. Even our smart bombs cannot reliably hit and destroy every weapons and storage site in Iraq for the simple reason that we do not know where all the sites are. After the bombing stops, Mr. Hussein will still be able to manufacture weapons of mass destruction. Two decades ago, it was possible to thwart Saddam's nuclear ambitions by bombing a single installation. But today, nothing less than dismantling his regime will do. Because Saddam's nuclear program has fundamentally changed in those two decades. He no longer needs one large reactor to produce the deadly material necessary for atomic bombs. He can produce it in centrifuges the size of washing machines that can be hidden throughout the country. And I want to remind you that Iraq is a very big country. It is not the size of Monte Carlo. It is a big country. And I believe that even free and unfettered inspections will not uncover these portable manufacturing sites of mass death. Do you have any new evidence of Iraq's uh, weapon capabilities, uh, nuclear capabilities? I, I cannot give you um, uh, even an oblique uh, reference to uh, information in the last three years because I'm, uh, well, because I'm busy uh, going around the world visiting Washington. I'm not. Oh, we appreciate uh, you being. I'm not prying into uh, uh, privileged dossiers. Uh. The plan was always to bomb Iraq back to the Stone Age, destroy the infrastructure destabilize the country, and drive refugees to Europe. Here's an interview Osama bin Laden had with Pakistan Daily on September 28, 2001, translated by BBC. I have already said that we are not hostile to the United States. We are against the system, which makes other nations slaves of the United States, or forces them to mortgage their political and economic freedom. This system is totally in the control of the American Jews whose first priority is Israel, not the United States. It is simply that American people are themselves the slaves of the Jews and are forced to live according to the principles and laws laid by them. So the punishment should reach Israel. In fact, it is Israel which is giving a bloodbath to innocent Muslims, and the U.S. is not uttering a single word. If there is a message that I may send through you, I address the mothers of the American troops. To these mothers I say, if they are concerned for their sons, then let them object to the U.S. government's policy. Bush was the frontman. Twenty years before Bush was in office, Netanyahu published books calling for war with all these countries. In 1996, five years before Bush was in office, American Jews officially planned to destabilize Iraq for Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Then they went on to work for Bush. 
Even Bush's speechwriter, David Frum, was a Jewish neocon. Benjamin Netanyahu is the founder of the War on Terror, which has killed millions of people based on lies. He was the one who first introduced the War on Terror at the Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism in 1979. He admits this in his own book. The Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism was convened by the Jonathan Institute on July 2nd to the 5th, 1979, to focus public attention on the grave threat that international terrorism poses to all democratic societies, to study the real nature of today's terrorism, and to propose measures for combating and defeating international terror movements. The current threat promises to become intolerable when terrorists gain access as they show every sign of doing, to weapons of mass destruction, or when they gain control of whole peoples and governments and establish themselves as de facto terrorist states. In the face of such paralysis, pusillanimity, and impotence, the Jerusalem Conference was convened to begin the formation of an anti-terror alliance in which all the democracies of the West must join. The purpose of the War on Terror is for the West to fight all of Israel's wars for them. Trump is now leading this effort, just as Bush did. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see a regime change, at least I would, in Iran, just as I would like to see in Iraq. The question now is a practical question. What is the best place to proceed? It's not a question of whether Iraq's regime should be taken out, but when should it be taken out? It's not a question of whether you'd like to see a regime change in Iran, but how to achieve it. The application of power is the most important thing in winning the war on terrorism. If I had to say, what are the three principles of winning the war on terror? It's like, what are the three principles of real estate, the three L's, location, location, location? The three principles of winning the war on terror are the three W's, winning, winning, and winning. The more victories you amass, the easier the next victory becomes. The first victory in Afghanistan makes the second victory in Iraq that much easier. The second victory in Iraq will make the third victory that much easier too, but it may change the nature of achieving that victory. May. It may be possible to have implosions taking place. I don't guarantee it, Mr. Turney, but I think it makes it more likely, uh, and therefore I think the choice of Iraq is a good choice. It's the right choice. Yeah. The director of Mossad, Yozi Cohen, also admits that Iran is the primary objective. It's the biggest country out of Israel's enemies and also has the biggest prize. If they can accomplish regime change in Iran, they get their pipeline back and all that oil starts flowing to Israel again. The Mossad, the intelligence agency who did 9-11, meets with the president's team to brief them on what to say about war with Iran and Syria. All nations of conscience must work together to isolate Iran. Deny it. The mainstream media, which is in fact controlled by Jews, something they brag about, is pushing the exact same propaganda for Iran that they did for Iraq. The attacks are connected to Al Qaeda, but is Iran pushing the terror buttons? Al Qaeda is in Baghdad. American officials say Tehran is forging ties with Al Qaeda. There were connections and discussions between senior Iraqi leaders and senior Al Qaeda members. Iran is playing together with Al Qaeda. And Iran continued to defy the UN by refusing to answer questions about its nuclear program. Saddam Hussein has no intention of cooperating with the United Nations. Iranians are moving forward with their nuclear program quicker than expected. Saddam's illegal weapons program is going strong right under the inspector's noses. Israel has got caught committing false flag terrorism against the United States and Britain multiple times. The King David Hotel bombing in 1946. Operation Susanna in 1954, also known as the Levant Affair the attack on the USS Liberty, 1967. The Mossad's motto is, by way of deception, thou shalt do war. 9-11 was a false flag to start the Iraq war. An Israeli lobbyist, Patrick Lawson, is openly calling for a false flag killing Americans so that a war with Iran could be started. I frankly think that crisis initiation is really tough. And it's very hard for me to see how the United States uh, president can get us to war with Iran. Um, 
which leads me to conclude that if, in fact, compromise is not coming, that the traditional way of Amer America gets to war is what would be best for U.S. interests. Uh, some people might think that Mr. Roosevelt wanted to get us into World War II, as David mentioned. You may recall we had to wait for Pearl Harbor. Some people might think Mr. Wilson wanted to get us into World War I. You may recall he had to wait for the Lusitania episode. Some people might think that Mr. Johnson wanted to send troops to Vietnam. You may recall we had to wait for the Gulf of Tonkin episode. Uh, we didn't go to war with Spain until the USS, uh, yes. until the Maine exploded. And may I point out that Mr. Lincoln did not feel he could call out the Federal Army until Fort Sumter was attacked, which is why he ordered the commander at Fort Sumter to do exactly that thing which the South Carolinians had said would cause an attack. So if, in fact, the Iranians aren't going to compromise, it would be best if somebody else started the war. Uh, I mentioned that explosion uh, on August 17th. Uh, we could step up the pressure. I mean, look, people, Iranian submarines periodically go down. Someday one of them might not come up. Who would know why? <laughs> we are in the game of using covert means against the Iranians. We, we could get nastier at that. I am Danny Dayan, the Consul General of Israel to New York. This flag was in the World Trade Center, and eventually it was recovered by the YPD, and it landed in Mayor Bloomberg's office. And Mayor Bloomberg decided to present it to President Shimon Peres. President Peres decided wisely that it should stay in Israeli territory in New York City. It has significance for me in, in so many levels, in so many levels, resilience, anti-terrorism, the bond between Israel and the United States of America, and especially New York in particular. It has survival. It has really so many levels of significance that it really, I think, is my main source of strength. Right, that's the view from the Palestinian side. Joining me now here in the BBC World Studio is the former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, uh, who's in London at the moment. Mr. Barak, welcome to BBC World. First, your reaction, having heard what's happened. At least four planes have been hijacked, and uh, there may be more. The world will not be the same from today on. I don't know who is responsible. I believe we will know in 12 hours. Uh, ben Laden sits in Afghanistan. There is a source but of terror. who else terror. you identify though? Uh, because we're not saying he's responsible for this necessarily. No, no, we, we don't say that he's responsible. Every simple step, crossing borders or going on a plane or, or on a, a ship will become more complicated. It's a time to launch a, a operational, concrete war against uh, uh, terror, even if it takes certain pains from the routine activities of our normal society. This is the time to deploy a globally concerted effort led by the United States, the UK, Europe, and Russia against all sources of terror. Consistently, along six or ten years, Iran Iraq, Libya, North Korea. This is the only way without this clarity of purpose there will be no world order, no world order possible. Jared Kushner is Trump's Jewish son-in-law who he appointed senior advisor to the president. His job is to broker a peace deal between the Israelis and Palestinians. Trump said to Kushner, if you can't produce Middle East peace, nobody can. In reality, Kushner is literally the worst person Trump could have chosen for the job. There's huge conflicts of interest here. Kushner is financing settlements which are illegal under international law. Settlements are essentially land theft. Israel is illegally occupying the West Bank, bulldozing Palestinian homes, forcing those people to become homeless, then building neighborhoods where only Jewish people can live. Look down the hill. 28 brand new homes being built in my yeshuv. God gave me this land a few thousand years ago. 
and I came back and claimed it. This is institutionalized racism. Just imagine if this was done to Jewish people. Kushner also finances the IDF, which is notorious for war crimes. After Elor Azaria was caught on film executing a Palestinian, Deputy Defense Minister Eli Ben-Dahan proposed a bill that would extend the immunity privilege granted to IDF soldiers for actions committed during military operations. Basically a license to kill. Rabbi Ben-Dahan, who proposed this bill, is another Jewish supremacist. He publicly said in 2013 that Palestinians are like animals, they aren't human. They don't just hate Palestinians, they have the same view for all non-Jews. A Jew always has a much higher soul than a Gentile, even if he is a homosexual. Ben Dahan was appointed Deputy Defense Minister by Netanyahu, joining his regime of racist thugs. These are the people who are telling us that Hitler was evil. Kushner is also financing Chabad Lubavitch, who are the spiritual leaders of the Israeli government. They make no attempt to hide their Jewish supremacism. A local rabbi is under fire today for statements he made that some say promote extremism. Rabbi Manus Friedman from St. Paul was apparently answering the question, how should Jews treat their Arab neighbors? He told Moment magazine, quote, the only way to fight a moral war is the Jewish way. Destroy their holy sites. Kill men, women, and children. Chabad rabbi Manus Friedman does not believe in Western morality. He endorses killing civilians and children, and shooting first before you even know if they're going to shoot at you. He also said, the first Israeli Prime Minister who declares that he will follow the Old Testament will finally bring peace to the Middle East. This describes Netanyahu 100%. When he says peace, that means ruling the world from Jerusalem. He justifies the statements by sourcing the Torah, Deuteronomy 2.34. At that time, we took all his towns and completely destroyed them, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Thou shalt not murder applies only to a Jew killing another Jew. Rabbis Yitzhak Shapira and Yosef Elitza wrote a book about this called King's Torah, which became an Israeli bestseller. Here's the Jewish Daily Forward's article on Chabad rabbi Yitzhak Ginsberg. He told the New York Jewish Week that halakha, or traditional Jewish law, would probably permit seizing an unwilling non-Jew for a liver transplant to save the life of a Jew. New York Times finds disproportionate role of Israelis in world organ trafficking. Coincidence, right? Kushner visits the grave of former Chabad leader to receive inspiration and blessing. On his birthday in 2007, Kushner paid $1.8 billion for the 666 Fifth Avenue building. He paid more than three times as much as the building was worth. Jared's father, Charles Kushner, was appointed chairman of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. But before being approved, he was sentenced to two years in prison for illegal campaign contributions, tax evasion, and witness tampering. He got the last charge by paying a hooker to have sex with his brother-in-law then sending the videotape to his sister. Charles Kushner is actually very close to Netanyahu. The Israeli media obtained Netanyahu's partly handwritten list of wealthy Americans most likely to fund his primary elections, and Charles's name was near the top. Here's Netanyahu playing soccer at the Joseph Kushner Hebrew Academy back in 1999. Netanyahu has known Jared Kushner since he was a kid and even slept on his bed. Netanyahu is literally in bed with the Trump administration. Can I reveal, Jared, how long we've known you? <laughs> well, he, he was never small. He was always big. <laughs> he was always tall. But I, 
I've known the president and I've known his uh, family and his team for a long time. And there is no greater supporter of the Jewish people and the Jewish state than President Donald Trump. I think we should put that to rest. Thank you very much. Very nice. I appreciate that very much. Now, in his own life, I'm going to tell you something shocking, and it's actually the reason why I told all the non-Jews to stop watching this video. Here's a fact I don't really want conspiracy theorists to hear. All of Donald Trump's children are either married to or dating Jews. All of them. The most famous of his kids, Ivanka Trump, she married Jared Kushner, who's Jewish, And she converted to Judaism herself. She actually took a Jewish name, Yael Trump. Her kids, Trump's grandkids, are Jewish. They probably call him Zadie. But it's not just Ivanka. Donald Jr. is married to Vanessa Hayden, who's Jewish. Eric Trump is married to Lara Yunaska, who's Jewish. They married under a Jewish chuppah or wedding canopy at Mar-a-Lago an exclusive club that used to ban Jews until Trump filed a massive lawsuit against the bigots to let the Jews in. And then there's Tiffany Trump, Donald Trump's other daughter by Marla Maples. She's not married yet, but she's dating a Jewish man named Ross Mechanic. Trump has one more kid with Melania. His name is Barron. He's just 10. So it's not yet five kids out of five who were with Jews, but I wouldn't bet against Barron dating a Jew, would you? Ehud Barak mentioned plans for the TSA and the Patriot Act one hour after the North Tower collapsed. Who wrote the Patriot Act? Co-author of the Patriot Act was Michael Shirdoff. Shirdoff is an Israeli national through his parents. Both his parents are Israelis. His father, Rabbi Gershon Baruch Shirdoff, was a Talmud scholar. If you don't know what the Talmud is, it's in your best interest to look it up. His mother, Livia Eisenshirtoff, was the first airline hostess for El Al Airlines. She was also a founding member of the Mossad. She participated in Operation Magic Carpet, the famous airlift of Yemenite Jews to Israel. This was a highly complex and dangerous rescue campaign. Operatives of the Mossad Aliyah Beth were dispatched to Yemen to organize the operation which was kept secret and revealed to the media only after completion. Source, Strategic Intelligence Volume 1 by Loke Johnson, former special assistant to the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Oversight. The Patriot Act was written by someone connected to the Mossad. The Patriot Act was a result of 9-11, which was orchestrated by the Mossad. In 2005, Shirdoff became Secretary of Homeland Security. Before that, he was Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice, where he traced the 9-11 terrorist attacks to Al-Qaeda. In that position, he oversaw the investigation of the 9-11 terrorist attacks and declared no investigative interest in the Israeli detainees, resulting in their release. His brother, Benjamin Chernoff, was also involved in the cover-up. He was part of Poplar Mechanics 9-11, debunking the myths, claiming that fire brought down all three buildings. His wife, Meryl Shirdoff, served on the board of the ADL New Jersey and chaired its Civil Rights Committee. The ADL is an organization of Jewish bullies who try to defame anyone critical of the Israeli government. Bans in the area, white bans. In one case, a van was picked up by, and by police and people arrested at the access to a major bridge. The van was filled with explosives, and the two people in it were Israelis. In Bergen, New Jersey, same day, a van with several people in it had set up cameras. Before the first plane hit, they were filming the Twin Towers, and they were celebrating. High fives, it was, a, it was a good thing for them. Residents called police, police arrested them, all five were Israelis. 
All of the Israelis who were apprehended in those vans were later released in about two months at the direction of Michael Cherkov, then the second director of Homeland Security, a dual U.S.-Israeli national. Uh, what's your general viewpoint about people who think the federal government was involved in 9-11? I think that that's uh, in the same category as Holocaust denial and those people who still aren't convinced that President Obama was born in Hawaii. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion, with a T. Hello, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, uh, you mentioned the September 10th, 2001 mindset. Uh, that made me nervous. I was wondering if the missing $2, $2 trillion plus that uh, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld reported on September 10th, 2001, you know, where that where those trillions went? Did, they, did you all ever find it? I have to say, I must have, I must have missed that news report about the missing uh, trillions. The World Trade Center Security was an Israeli-owned company. Security at all three of the airports from which the four aircraft on 9-11 departed, ICTS, was an Israeli security company. That security company, by the way, also had security at the airports in Paris and Amsterdam later, from which the so-called shoe and underwear bombers departed. After the underwear bomber got through ICTS, the Israeli airport security company, Shertoff was all over the media advertising body scanners without actually disclosing his relationship with Rapiscan Systems, who manufactures the machines. He is profiting from these police state measures. What happened immediately after the Las Vegas shooting? In the future, we may start seeing metal detectors slash body scanners in hotels, casinos, schools, etc. The Jewish billionaires who are pushing this are also financing Trump. In his 1995 book, Fighting Terrorism, Netanyahu wrote, Restrict ownership of weapons. Tighten gun control beginning with registry of weapons. Undoubtedly, the leaders of the United States in particular could be subjected to a barrage of criticism that they are curtailing civil freedoms and that they are overreacting. They should reject this criticism. The United States has given Israel over a quarter of a trillion dollars of taxpayer money to colonize Palestine. In return, Israel is trying to disarm Americans. There is no greater slap in the face than this. It's a crucial prerequisite for the building of the Promised Land. And we are deeply grateful for all that we have received from the United States, for all that we have received from this chamber, from this body. But I believe there can be no greater tribute to America's long-standing economic aid to Israel than for us to be able to say we are going to achieve economic independence. We are going to do it. In the next four years, we are going to begin the long-term process of gradually reducing the level of your generous economic assistance to Israel. And I'm convinced that our economic policies will lay the foundation for total self-reliance and great economic strength.
Netanyahu will go on camera and thank Americans for the increased military aid, while plotting to disarm Americans. He brings up Israeli gun control, but doesn't tell you the reality of it. The Israeli government allows Jews to own guns, while non-Jews can't own guns. The Israeli government passed a law sentencing Palestinians to 20 years in prison for throwing stones. They have the Palestinians disarmed and are straight up stealing their private property. These are the people that are trying to take your guns away. Israeli Justice Minister Ayla Chaked, who used Facebook in 2014 to promote genocide against Palestinians, is leading her government's successful efforts to press Facebook and Google to censor content. Facebook complies with 95% of Israeli requests to remove inciting content, while YouTube complies with 80%. According to Ayla Chaked, any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. She even went as far as saying that U.S. criticism distorts reality. The Israel Anti-Boycott Act They are trying to make it illegal to boycott Israel in the United States. Violations would be subject to a minimum civil penalty of $250,000 and a maximum criminal penalty of $1 million and 20 years in prison. This is in violation of the First Amendment, punishing Americans based solely on their expressed political beliefs. 45 senators and 237 congressmen signed on to this bill when it was announced. The people who want to take away your rights are homicidal maniacs whose policies have killed millions. In the two parts of this documentary, I included as much evidence as possible so that even someone who is new to all this will have no doubt what's going on. Thanks for watching. Share this information. We all need to get more active, and if every person watching this does, we'll change public opinion and then bring down these bastards who rule over us. When I become president, the days of treating Israel like a second-class citizen will end on day one. Just looking for a